afternoon, Cherries fans, and welcome to this latest video here on Up the Cherries in All Departments. Now, the other day, I did make a video where I suggested a certain manager to actually take over from Iriola if we dispose of his services. Of course, that manager was Jesse Marsh. Now, we've had quite a few dealings with Leeds during this window, and also Leeds with the ones who were heading up the hunt for our manager, Andoni Iriola. We've, of course, signed Sinistera. We've signed Tyler Adams. We've also signed Max Ahrens. And Jaden Anthony went the other way. It will also be quite interesting to see what this person does say about my suggestion. Now, of course, there's no better person to actually bring on this show to talk about Leeds United. And if I am talking absolute bollocks about Jesse Marsh, than somebody from the leading Leeds United podcast, The Square Bull. So it is a pleasure to welcome back onto the show, Dan Moylan. Welcome back, Dan. How are you doing, mate? I'm very well, thank you. Um, thanks for having me all the way down here in the Championship. Yes. Um, <laughs> uh, I, t I tell you what, you must be... Well, you're having more fun than we are, let's be honest. You're winning games. You've 100%, won a game. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, I, wouldn't have, I wouldn't have said this um, when you absolutely pumped us at the back end of last season, uh, Dean Court, but I am absolutely delighted that we went down after the way the last couple of seasons have gone. We're having so much more fun. And as you can imagine, it's not particularly good fun at the moment. Um, but we'll get, get stuck in all to all that because, of course, there's lots of links between the two clubs. And I kind of put my foot in it and created another link yesterday. So we'll, <laughs> the we'll Jesse Marsh. <laughs> yes, this is the Jesse Marsh. So we'll cover that bit as well. But um firstly wanted to touch on something that you did, which was amazing. Um, in memory of Gary Speed, um, uh, where you walked from Wales, from Gary Speed's hometown, all the way back to Elland Road, uh via some sites like Ellesmere Port as well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, so that, we, we've actually done it um two years on the trot now. Uh, yes. So the first the first year we walked from Gary's uh, first playing field, which is just around the corner from his house. It's where his, his mum lives just a couple of streets away. His mum, Carol, she came out and saw us off, which was really nice. Very, very moving as well. Um, there's a big memorial stone there. Yeah, and we walked. It was a very brief. I mean, we could say it was an international walk, but we were yes. only in Wales for about, you know, maybe 500 yards or something like that, half a mile. Um, crossed back over into England. But yeah, we went via Ellesmere Port, which wasn't the most picturesque uh, of places. I've but, been there, um, Dan. I've been yeah. there. To be honest, believe it or not, years ago, and I'll tell this story, um, there was a girl that I went out with at university. Very nice girl. Hello, Lexi, if you're watching. <laughs> um, but yes, um, I can completely agree with you. It's, hmm, yeah. <laughs> Say no more. As as you were saying, sorry. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's quite industrial and rustic. Um, yes. But yeah, we ended up going uh, the first one. So we went via uh, a variety of northern towns, um, finishing mm -hmm. up back in uh, back in Leeds. Yes, it was. Uh, we it was sort of symbolically ninety two miles because Gary Speed played for us in nineteen ninety two when we won the league title. So yeah. it kind of you know it all nicely joined up. So we did that the first year, raised over. Uh, I think it was something along the lines of eighty or ninety thousand pounds. We did for Andy's Man Club. And we did it for the Samaritans as well in the first year. Second year it was Andy's Man Club. And we've done somewhere in the region of about, again, £70,000, I think, um, for the second year. So the second year we walked from Everton back to uh, Ellen Road while we were in the midst of a relegation battle against Everton, which was pretty funny. But, um, yeah. yeah, it was really good. And we had uh, a couple of celebrity guests to along to walk with us as well. Um, Matt Lewis, who played Neville in the in the Harry Potter films, yep. big Leeds fan from around these parts, uh, came along and did it with us, with his uh, brother Anthony as well, who does one of the, he was one of the voiceover announcers for for the BBC, does some acting himself. So, no, it was really good. We had um, It was a brilliant four days on, on both occasions, and we've raised loads of money for for a brilliant charity and I need to give a massive plug to Andy's Man Club as well because they are they're a brilliant men's um peer-to-peer -peer, uh, support group and I don't know how far south it's spread just yet Andy's Man Club because it kind of originated organically in in Halifax um through the death of a it was a rugby league player who who took his own life and his friends and his family said we need to stop this happening again and the Andy referenced in Andy's Man Club um is the guy who did take his own life. So it's a club that would have saved his life, they think, if um, if he'd have still been here. So it's just a, it's an amazing cause, um, particularly because we have so many uh, male audience members, so many men go to football. Yeah. 
Um, and I actually went along to a group after we did the walk, after we completed the walk um, this second year. And it's one of the most moving experiences of my life, hearing men who are really up against it, really struggling, just getting so much out of speaking to other blokes in a completely like non-judgy. It's not that kind of, you know, um, circle of trust kind of thing that you might associate with kind of group yeah. therapy or something like it's not like that at all it's just ordinary blokes getting together and chatting and it's sort of it started from halifax it's spread across the north and it seems to be sort of organically moving its way south and further up into scotland as well so keep an eye out for it and and it's just um it's a brilliant 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 thing um that we, we were so proud to to support and i got infected blisters on both walks both years oh, i thought I'd learned, le- yeah i thought i'd learned my lesson like uh, after the first <laughs> year but um it still happened again the second year so uh my feet were in a bit of a mess but i think maybe if we do it again, i think we're gonna give, give it a rest next year but if we do it again the year after or something like that maybe walk from newcastle or something one of his um gary's other former clubs then hopefully i will get to a year where i'm blister free because it's it's not much fun <laughs> the descri- link is in the description how to donate as well oh, so brilliant. please do give what you can um and i've also got this sort of thing to look forward to because my plan is actually to do in memory of a good friend of mine that passed away with cancer al guard uh to do Brittany to vitality it's called Right so from his home in Brittany all the way to the vitality. So yeah, I've got to look forward to um infected blisters as well. Well, if you need any tips, get in touch, or honestly, because it's been such a learning experience. Um, you don't you it's hard to explain what it's like. It's not the necessarily what we were sort of walking 27 miles on the first day on both occasions. It's not the distance so much as then getting up the day after and trying it again. Um yeah. you just absolutely it hammers your feet and your feet go through um, punishment like you never, well, they've never experienced before in their lives. But yeah, brilliant. So good luck with that. Good luck. No, thank you. And, you know, it was great how you did the video as well. You know, a lot of humour added in there as well. Um, And of course, John Richardson was there as well, wasn't he? Can't forget. He was, yeah. First year, yeah. John is a big Leeds fan. um, And bless him, he he showed up on the final day, but then he bailed out before the final home stretch. from the pub to Ellen Road. So we all met up at a pub about a mile away. So all the walkers, because obviously everybody walks at different speeds. So we all met up at a pub. Everybody had a pint. And then all the slow coaches, I think I was at the back by that point because me infected blisters. Um, <laughs> so we all we all did the final mile together down to Ellen Road and uh, walked the long approachway, Lowfields Road to it. And we were all just, we all just burst into tears when we saw like all the friends and family uh, waiting for us at the bottom. And Leeds United opened up the Gary Speed Suite as well inside the stadium for us, which is fantastic and gave us some free um, food and drinks. So yeah, it was, um, yeah, it was, it was amazing. Um, just, just great fun. Yeah. And uh, John bailed out before that final bit because he didn't want to do the full john terry bit you know um yes stealing the glory putting the shirt on kind of thing but he walked with us for most of the final day and then said look i'm gonna bail out now um i need to get home and i'll leave you to kind of bring the glory here get the glory you know as you bring it home over the line yeah fair enough fair enough no well done to you all and you know a great cause and please do give what you can cherish fans well i'll tell you what we'll we'll get stuck into the football Everybody is probably waiting for me to speak to you about Jesse Marsh. So we'll leave that right to the end um, because I put my foot in it um, and made this video um, and said, do you know what? You know, Jesse Marsh might be a sensible appointment on a temporary basis, but we'll come to that at the end. Be careful what you wish for, Craig. That's all I will say. Yeah, I, a lot of people have been saying that, a lot of Leeds fans. Um, and do you know what? I absolutely love Leeds fans because you've just been ribbing me for it. Just, do you know what? It's great fun. It's great fun. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk about, though, because, of course, Leeds were linked with Andoni Iriola. Yeah. And, of course, Iriola was managed at one point by... The man that you do worship in those parts, Marcelo yeah. Bielsa. Um, how close was it? And are you now thinking, thank God we didn't get him? Yeah, it's it's a funny one, isn't it? Because as we'll come on to speak about Marsh, I guess, like you can't take what happens at one club as an example of what will happen at every club. You've got to be, you know, be careful and, and see how things unfold. But um Iriola, yes, yeah, so to rewind when we knew things were we're going to be changing at Ellen Road. They wanted to bring him in. Um, unfortunately, it was too late in the season. They made the decision to make the managerial change too late. Uh, they should have done it going into the World Cup because we had we had the chief exec at Leeds. Angus Kinnear comes on and does kind of a, a pre-season, early season um, interview with us. And and it was quite candid and said, we we, were, we got it wrong. We, we made the decision to, to change at the wrong time. By the sounds of it, our sporting director, Victor Orta, who's now left and gone to Sevilla, um, 
he dug his heels in, wanted to keep hold of Marsh for longer, and I think they kept on hold of him for too long. They had their eyes on Iriola, I think, when he was at Vallecano. Um, would have liked him to come in because I think they'd realized by that point that the football that Marsh was serving up didn't sit well with Leeds fans after Bielsa, which I remember when we spoke last time and we were talking about the football that Bielsa plays. It's just, yeah. it's swashbuckling. It's so much fun. And I think to then hear that we were in for Iriola or was one of the names being mentioned. And as I understand it, he was, but the, it's quite a complex situation with exit clauses in Spain um, in that, as I understand it, it's the responsibility of the manager or the player to, to pay their exit release clause to the Spanish FA directly. So the club like Leeds could have paid him and then he could have paid the Spanish FA. But by the sounds of it, he wasn't willing to take that step. He'd indicated a willingness to come to Ellen Road, but not the willingness to take that step. So, you know, go figure as the, uh, as the saying goes. So it just never happened. And they looked at Arna Slot as well, who's at Feyenoord. Um, they were the two top targets, neither of which they they managed to get. And you know, we saw what happened. We just went from, well, well wildly. It's like, I don't know, going around the club at blooming 2.30 in the morning with the lights just about to come up, just desperately trying to find somebody to take home. And that's that was kind of the the story of the, the second half of Leeds United season after after Marsh went. It just it spiraled out of control and it was bad. Um, so, yeah, I think we had, we had designs on Iriola. We would have liked it for him to come to Leeds, just mainly because he was said to be pupil of Bielsa. But there's a lot of people who kind of fall into that category. And, and truthfully, I think we liked the idea of it as much as we knew anything about it. I don't think we knew enough about him um, outside of his good record at Vallecano. So, yeah, it hurt a little bit um, when we saw him go to Bournemouth. And, and I guess you can then go straight into saying the same about Max Ahrens as well. Or is, is it Ahrens or Ahrens? I don't know. Ahrens, Ahrens, right. Max Ahrens, yes. Yeah. Um, of course, you were in for him. You'd already agreed the fee hadn't you yeah and yeah. then it all went pear-shaped yeah i mean what, what i mean uh, can i ask you a question if that's okay yeah, i'm sure show it. but i'm just curious to know what what is iraola's football like because bielsa's was kind of predicated on taking mm. risks moving it around quickly playing out from the back and everything i see of what bomber fans are discussing are saying it's just chaotic there seems to be almost no plan it started sensibly it looks like in that first game against west ham that we was pressing high you know, we was controlling the game. We was playing out from the back and it was quite well structured. The biggest problem I think that Israel has got is that he hasn't got the players at Bournemouth to actually play that style. And would he have had that at Leeds? You know, that's that's the big question for me. Mm. Because it seems like it's all gone chaotic after the Brighton game. And we started that game well. We went one nil up, and then we made a mistake. Neto and Kirkes got were complete. Well, they they didn't communicate. Conceded a goal 16 seconds after our own kickoff, and then it's just all fallen to pieces. The Arsenal game really didn't turn up. Complete mess. Um, Everton away has to be one of the most shambolic performances we've seen in the Premier League, and then. Gary O'Neill coming back and getting one best <laughs> one over on the side that sacked him, which to be fair, he was very, very humble and full respect to him. Yeah. I'm just looking down your results now, just catching up on them. And of course, yeah, I realize you haven't, you haven't won yet this season. Have you? So it's not looking good for, for yeah. Iola. Um, and this is the thing. I mean, what Bielsa did when he came in at Leeds in the summer of 2018 was he looked at what was there and saw within the squad that, existed uh players like calvin phillips for example who's moved since moved to man city and become a mainstay you know in, in england's midfield liam cooper a player that i think was the center back that Leeds would have quite happily replaced all the fans would have you know year after year after year became a defensive mainstay uh and he, he he made water into wine and i think that is where the genius of bielsa lies and i remember saying to you you know i'm glad actually that Bielsa didn't end up at Bournemouth because it would have hurt too much um, yeah. seeing him at another, another English club. We can kind of just enjoy him at arm's length now. He's managing Uruguay. Um, and people are often question, you know, about what is his genius, but he does, he takes what fundamentally ordinary players and makes them so much better. And maybe that's, that's the thing that you can't replicate with his, with his pupils. It's, it's that sort of in, baked in inherent knowledge of footballing talent and 
Um, it, it coaches everything from like body shape to position, how you should receive the ball, things like yeah. that. It's it's unlike anything apparently that a lot of players have ever seen or heard before, and is quite unique in football. The only man I could really compare that to is Eddie Howe, yeah. where he made players like Steve Cook, Simon Francis, Tommy Elphick into players that could play it in the top flight. After Mark Pugh, you know, after playing all their careers, you know, in the lower leagues. So I don't think Iriola is capable of that because mm. in against Wolves, I don't know if you saw our the goal we conceded right at the end. It was basically a pass out from Neto to Phil Billing on the six yard box. Phil Billing ran it two further yards, lost the ball, and then it was one two in the back of the net. And it's that sort of thing that it just seems to be chaos. You know, he seems to, things have gone wrong, but he doesn't know how to put them right. Yeah. Yeah. I think this is the thing, like Bielsa's system, and I, I know I keep going back to him, but he's kind of the reference point for everything when it comes to Iraola for me anyway. Um, it's always about putting in like massive sense of confidence in the players and, from coming into Leeds, we we experienced nothing but an upward curve until we hit the last season when it, it did hit the buffers a little bit. But even then, we were still controlling games and in all the games that we even got pumped in, you know, we'd still, like I think in the final game that Bielsa was in charge at Leeds, we lost 4-0 at home to Spurs and in a similar sort of way, like the you could see the confidence had evaporated. They didn't, they just didn't want to, uh, they just didn't want to, uh, they just couldn't go through with what, what they'd sort of been coached to do. But... Yeah. They did as well, if that makes sense. They made 15 chances in that final game against Spurs, and we still lost 4-0. It was, it was kind of weird, and it was there was almost a, like an air of a wake around the whole thing because we could see how good it was, but it kind of stopped working to an extent. But you wonder if, because there's been this wobbling confidence, maybe Iriola just doesn't... Maybe does he have the chops to kind of get everybody confident to play that sort of high-risk football? Because it is high-risk, isn't it, if you want to play out from the back yeah. like that and have possession on the edge of your own box? It, I don't think so. This is my big concern is I just don't think so. And I think it's a case that we're trying to play like Arsenal, but Arsenal have been doing it for 25 years where it's that nice controlled controlling games. We're not even controlling games against Everton. And that's a real concern because they, to be honest, Everton, Dan, are even worse than they were last year. Yeah. So I think it probably says it all, but Actually, it's quite interesting you say about Victor Orta um, because Iriola has been linked to Sevilla. And do you agree with me that maybe going back to Spain would be the best route for him? Potentially, yeah. And I think so. And one of the things we've learned about Orta in the in the last year or two is that he he sort of a, he gets a little bit of a, a thing for certain managers, which is how we ended up with Jesse Marsh, funnily yeah. enough. And, and I think Iriola definitely ticked that that same box for him as well as uh, one of his sort of dream, uh, dream, I guess, dream managers, really a dream coach. Um, potentially. Yeah, it, I guess so. Yeah. Maybe he needs to go back to Spain and be at a club like Sevilla that's bigger than Vallecano so he can prove it, I guess, or maybe get them back because they know they're struggling at the minute and they've got financial problems, haven't they? But I know, I know he's not been allowed his assistant, wasn't given a work permit, was he as well? And you wonder how much has kind of, that's been his undoing as well at Bournemouth. I don't know. That's a big thing for a lot of Bournemouth fans is that that assistant normally compliments and any failings in a manager, you know, they normally cover up. For example, you know, Jason Tindall, when he was, and I know he was number one here, but without Eddie Howe, it doesn't work. And I could do question without Jason Tindall, would Eddie Howe be the manager that he is? Yeah, um, and it, but it's, it's similar to, to, again, going back to Bielsa, has yeah. a ready-made team of people who drop everything and move with him as soon as he mm -hmm. goes. With the recruitment of Farker this summer as well, Farker's brought in his own team, ready to go. Um, it's him, 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 and him from Norwich. You know, goalkeeper coach, the full shebang. So you wonder just um, how much that puts you at a bit of a disadvantage. And we saw with Jesse Marsh, funnily enough, and this is an interesting point to get into maybe. Marsh didn't come to Leeds with a ready-made coaching team either. It was a little bit slapdash and a little bit thrown together. And I think there's a feeling within the corridors at Leeds that the people they did bring in weren't necessarily up to scratch, didn't have the uh, the top level ability um, that maybe could have saved Jesse Marsh from himself a little bit. Uh, so the, yeah. the, the the backroom team came in late and it was all a little bit thrown together. It didn't feel like they went into that, that period of recruitment with Marsh coming in with a plan in the summer because he came in, did the 12 games, kept us up, 
And then in the summer, you thought, right, let's reset and we start to do that thing now. And then we just never seemed to, even with a 12-game leading period, when it got to the summer, didn't put the coaching team together. So it must it must hinder a manager, mustn't it, when they don't have their trusted lieutenants around them. And that's um, one another subject, really, that I wanted to cover as well. Um, and it's quite good we've walked into that sense, is a lot of Bournemouth fans are saying that the old boys club at Bournemouth which includes the likes of Tommy Elphick, Simon Francis, Richard Hughes, Deal Blake, um, so on and so forth, need to actually be cleared out for this new this new era, effectively. But, again, is that be careful what you wish for? Yeah, I think a little bit. Again, there are echoes, parallels with what happened at Leeds, and I think they've, they've realised that, we possibly relied on the team that got us promoted for too long. So talking about Liam Cooper, Patrick Bamford was without any competition. Like it's good to have Bamford in the squad now. He's still yeah. more than capable at this level, but we've since got Joel Peru and added to it. So that all the, the expectation is not on Bamford's shoulders. And I think there is a feeling that they possibly um, were not too loyal. I think is, is, is the wrong phrase. They were too reliant on that promotion squad. You know, we should have built on them sooner. Uh, I think so there's an argument for it, but it's different. It's, it's, it goes on a case-by-case -case basis, doesn't it? Club-by-club, club, you know what your club needs to, to retain its identity because we tried to shift identity too much in the last few years. Post-Bielsa, they gave us Jesse Marsh. I mean, and again, it was famously sold to Leeds fans as a natural successor to, to Marcelo Bielsa. But Bielsa was all about controlling possession and controlling games. Marsh was not, and this is, again, the be careful what you wish for thing. His style of football is... It's hardcore Red Bull, and it doesn't seem to have evolved. Even it's it's actually truer to Red Bull than the Red Bull clubs are, I think, these days, who have evolved past that kind of... It's kick and rush is the, the simplest way to describe it. It's percentages football, the sort of stuff that we grew up with in the 80s and 90s, but just dressed yeah. up with some fancy German terms with it as well, where they're swarming around the ball. Um, and we tried to go from controlling possession under Bielsa to Jesse Marsh, who was all about sacrificing possession, actually part of the Red Bull model. You don't need to have possession of the ball. You can you win it back high up the pitch, that kind of thing. You know, turn turnovers and forcing errors and things like that. But actually, when it, when it translates into practical football, real world Premier League teams can suss it out really, really quickly. So we we went from that to Marsh, from possession to no possession under Marsh. And then when they got rid of Marsh, I think they panicked and then yeah. floundered a little bit. Um, looked at a guy in the Netherlands, the former Ajax coach Schroeder deeply unpopular with his, the fans of his ex-clubs so they panicked and then they were about to appoint him didn't appoint him then put in Javi Gracia who used to be at, at Watford who was quite a gentle fellow um, going back to a much more controlled possession style so they kind of flip-flopped you know between styles and then ended up with Big Sam to close out the season because um, apparently I think you at Bournemouth broke Javi Gracia he was not in a good way after that defeat and they made the decision to get rid of him on the basis of his kind of emotional reaction to that defeat um, at Bournemouth so um, you killed Javi I'm afraid and then we ended up with Big Sam so it's all your fault yeah fair enough um, <laughs> and of course I think it was after that game as well Victor Orta and everybody left didn't they it's behind the scenes yeah Orta, Orta well, well Javi Gracia was Orta's man brought him in yeah. uh, and then like I say I think by the sounds of it Gracia um, ended up in a pretty bad way emotionally after mm -hmm. the defeat at Bournemouth and I think they realised that look this guy we can't leave him in charge of a dressing room if he's struggling emotionally with four games to go. It was just the Hail Mary. So they, they brought in Big Sam and it, it got no better. <laughs> you know, just the, the act of a desperate club, a desperate move by a desperate club. So, But we've, we've got all our, our ducks in a row. I'm sure Bournemouth fans will be delighted to know that things are uh, much happier at Leeds now. And they've brought in Farker, who honestly, it's so funny. Like if you'd have said to me, you would have put Daniel Farker in as the natural successor to Bielsa straight afterwards. Leeds fans yeah. would have turned the nose up, quite frankly, because he was seen as a Norwich yo-yo manager. We've got him here. He's fantastic. And the football's great. Well, to be honest, myself, I'm a little bit jealous because, of course, you are winning games. And, um, you know, that would be quite nice to see, apart from beating Stoke in the Carabao Cup, um, <laughs> you know, which, let's be honest, everybody beats Stoke. But Well, you're saying that we're about to kick off. We're, we're recording this like half an hour before the kickoff of the Stoke Leeds yes. game. So don't say that. Yeah. <laughs> Touch would you be all right. Touch would you be all right. But um, let's talk about um, somebody that you sold to us who's quite clearly broken. Um, yeah. Tyler Adams. Yeah, Not you got the second. You got the second-hand car, didn't you? From the garage, got it home, and then the, the gearbox fell out. Unfortunately. Yes. Um, yeah. I mean, but I mean, you can you can put Sinister and Adams together in this because, as I understand it, 
both threatened to sue Leeds United to get out this summer um, for slightly different reasons. So hence why there is a lot of poison being directed towards Tyler Adams. He was our best player before he got injured last season. But um, yeah, and I think I think had we retained him, uh, had he stayed fit and not got injured, we possibly might have just stayed up. Um, but we'll, you know, we'll never know. Uh, yeah, he uh, was absolutely desperate to get out. As I understand it, they offered to to match his Premier League wages because um, I don't know if you have picked up on this in Bournemouth circles, but there were a lot of loan release clauses and wage cut uh, clauses upon relegation to an extent, I think, that um, Farker said he'd never seen anything like it in Western Europe before. So everybody had um, loan release clauses in their contracts that take us way beyond the limit. So yeah, I think you're allowed seven or eight under uh, UEFA rules or FIFA rules, whichever it is. And we had about 10 or 11 players who had them. So ended up in a bit of a, well, in a bit of a sticky wicket, really, because they're saying, well, this is a clause in my contract. And they're saying, well, we can't release you because um, we're up to the limit, the competition limit. So I don't know quite how they navigated that. But as I understand it, they offered Tyler Adams um, the same as his Premier League wages. Um, so they offered to restore his wages through bonuses, incentivized him and said, you could come and play here for a year. You know, you're, the next World Cup for the United States is on home territory. So you're not yeah. going to lose your place in the national side. You're the captain of the national side, more to the point. Um, have a year with us in the championship, get us back out of it, become a hero, restore your, your reputation at Leeds. And he just was not having a bar of it. And I think it got quite unpleasant towards the end. And in the end, he threatened to sue because we had the, um, there was a, as I understand it, it was the 15th of August, I'm going to say, when all these, the the sale clauses and all the loan clauses expired for the players. So uh, the last two weeks of the window, it would have given us then two weeks to get everything sorted for ourselves. Yeah. Um, there was the bid that came in from Bournemouth. I don't know exactly how it unfolded, but as I understand it, Leeds felt that they were within their rights to keep him. He argued differently and then threatened to sue and said, if you do not let me go, I will see you in court. And Leeds could not afford to end up in a situation where where they lose a you know lose a twenty odd million pound player for nothing basically. If that goes to the court for arbitration for sport and they say that Adams is correct, we would have lost a player for nothing. So the safest option was to sell him, and then we got a little bit more over and above his release clause. So I think at the time it looked like a happy compromise for everybody. We got a little bit more money. Adams got his move. You got the player you wanted, and then obviously the hamstrings happened again. With Tyler Adams, though, of course, we have got an American owner, um, the owner of Vegas Golden Knights. And did you see any, with regards to returns on the merchandising front at Leeds through <laughs> Tyler Adams? Because that seems to be something. In fact, at the Vegas Golden Knights Stadium, they have actually got, you know, a selection of Bournemouth shirts. And the only player in there is Tyler Adams, the player that, of course, he's out until March now. Yeah, we did. We, we, I mean, we can say, even anecdotally, we picked up a lot more listeners, viewers from the States yeah. for the podcast and the show, um, people buying merch from out there. Now, I think they were, you know, because they're, they're a slightly different breed in the United States in the sense of that you, because there's not a strong domestic league and there's not the same level of attachment to like historical teams in the way that we do you know we pick up teams through our parents or the local area or whatever it might be the first that you filled yeah. in your sticker book but that heritage doesn't exist in the united states so you've got this huge market this huge interest where they're all looking for somebody to support so there's a lot more supporting of the individual players i think um stateside so they found it very very difficult when we basically turned on tyler adams when he said he wanted to leave um because it's not something that's necessarily culturally familiar to them but yeah i think like it will draw more interest into the club without a doubt you'll you should see it i would imagine not all of it good i will say some of it was quite difficult some argumentative some of the the us mnt hashtag um accounts on twitter x hard work at times who just do not understand yeah. the culture that we have over here but you know it's all uh it's all money in the till isn't it so the club are gonna if they're gonna sell some more shirts off it then why not yeah definitely definitely and hopefully fingers crossed when he comes back in march he will be fit. At this rate, though, you know, considering if we stick by Areola for much longer, you know, we could then be pretty much on our way to the championship anyway by that point. Well, I was going to say there's a warning from the future there, isn't there, that if he's sued to threaten to get out at Ellen Road, does he have a similar get-out agreement at Bournemouth? Um, and will he try and enforce it? And how far will he go? I mean, like I said, the circumstances are always yeah. different because he might have a different relationship with the owner there, um, which might might sway things. It might be better. But um, yeah, he did it to us. So, you know, 
you've got to be careful that he, he doesn't do it again. But um, mm-hmm. I guess we'll see, won't we? It's not real, you know, and traditionally it's not the sort of player that we normally go after because if those, if Richard Hughes, Neil Blake are aware of that, they wouldn't normally traditionally go after that sort of player because mm. if they look into sue their current club, um, it just feels that just feels something's a little bit different this time around, and it's a bit strange, like the transfer move that happened on deadline day. Now, mm. I probably got I don't know how much you know of this, but I don't believe Jaden Anthony knew anything about going to Leeds until it happened and Sinistera was yeah on his I- way down. It so happens that I've got a friend who uh, is this is one of a friend of a friend things, but it was somebody who was sat in the room with his agent when the when the call call came in. Um, so I've had a pretty good inside line into what actually did happen. Yeah, he was having dinner in the Bournemouth team hotel ahead of the Brentford fixture, wasn't he? And yes, um, had no idea about it. Initially said not interested in that, um, and then I think it was sort of pointed out to him: look, you're not going to play if we bring this guy in, so um, you might want to take this and. and Apparently, he had to be incentivized to do so. Uh, it's, it's, it's funny because he's coming to Leeds and said all the right things, like, oh, yeah, you know, looking forward to this. And as soon as I heard Leeds were interested and all that, in the way that footballers do, you know. But um, yeah, I, I don't think it was, um, again, another, it was quite, an, it's quite another messy conclusion to the transfer window. Because um, I think we thought we'd retain Sinistera by that point. But then these little rumblings, these little whispers started coming out of Leeds saying that he's not happy. Um, and it was the same sort of situation. I think he felt that, um, he should have been given the right to leave via one means or another, whether that was loan or transfer. And obviously the loan materialized in the end. Um, and yeah, him and his him and his agent looked happy in the photos anyway. So uh, God bless them football agents, eh? Yeah. Well, Sinistera, as you probably realize, hasn't been a revelation for Bournemouth. Mm. You know, he's yeah. played a couple of games. Um well he played he played friends. last year for us, he played in fits and starts. Um yeah. Whenever he played, he looked good. He looked a cut above a lot of what was around him. Um, always seemed to play the game at his own pace, is one thing I would say. Like, yeah. sometimes he feels like... He looks just sometimes like he's slightly behind the pace of the game, but then he'll do a trick, or he'll beat a man, and he'll go, oh, right, good. But um, we didn't really see enough of him to to form a, a fully rounded opinion of him, I don't think. And then he started this season well playing for us, but you can tell as well that he didn't really want to be in the in the championship. Because uh, he scored for us down, it might be the winner actually at Ipswich. Would be Ipswich four three, which yeah. is pretty pretty wild. Um, and then lo and behold, within a week, we've swapped him to all intents and purposes for for Jaden Anthony. And knowing that he was unhappy, knowing that he apparently threatened to to sue the club to get out as well, um, I feel I honestly feel like we've got the better of the two um, better side of the bargain there at the two players. Because I really like Jaden Anthony; he's a great player. I was going to say, Leeds fans, from what I understand, absolutely love Jaden Anthony. Would like to sign him permanently. Um, Bournemouth fans, myself included, really wish that it never happened and we'd like Anthony back. <laughs> well, no, please, no. <laughs> we're keeping him for now. Yeah, but I, I get it with Sinistera. Like he's, he's just been he's been injured on and off since we signed him, and that was one of the, the slightly worrying things about when we did when we did sign him was. Um, was his injury record because people were saying that Anthony who went to to Man United I mean quite apart from all the other stuff that's since unfolded um, mm-hmm. they had a similar sort of record in, in the Netherlands and saying you've got him for 20 about 22 million I think we paid for him something like that and um, and Anthony was like 90 million or something wild and they weren't vastly different players um, but yeah we never had a, a good enough run of Sinistera to, to really get a proper handle on him but what I didn't know is that he would have been a bit of a cheat code in the championship but I do wonder if Jaden Anthony's better suited to it, better to the scrap, to the 46 games, he's, he looks more robust. He's always fit, isn't he? Um, you know, touch wood and all that. Um, yeah. And he just, he puts in the work and you can tell from from watching him, he's not played a, a great deal for Leeds just yet, but I think he will feature more as the as the season goes on. But he's just got that, it's the decision making and the speed of thought that sets apart championship players from Premier League players and he's got the Premier League quality. You can just see it in, in how quickly he, he makes decisions and he always seems to make the right ones. And at this rate, at the moment, how Leeds are going and how Bournemouth are going, you wouldn't put it past the two teams swapping <laughs> places. And, you know, Jaden Anthony, you know, I'm guessing Leeds fans would sign him all day long for the oh, Premier League. All 100%, not. yeah. 100%, yeah. So, on what on the basis of what we've seen so far, which is not, it's not, like I say, it's not a huge amount, but everything we've seen so far, 
I've just I've really enjoyed watching him. He's a clearly a talented footballer. Yeah, definitely. Would take him in a heartbeat. Fair enough. Fair enough. Well, um, we'll quickly mention on, um, of course, oh, Max Aaron's, um, <laughs> and you know what happened there. Um, of course, Max Aaron's. There was something that was going around that somebody said that he was a bargain for Bournemouth. And to be fair, when when I've seen him, he does look a very good right back. Do you think that might be one that did get away? Or do you think, because, let's be honest, at Norwich, you know, he seems to be always in those sides that fail. Yeah, it, it was it was supposed to be like one of the next big things, wasn't he, for a while um, when yeah. he was at Norwich? There's supposed to be some pretty big club sniffing around with him. I mean, you don't know how much of that is agents talking and trying to push for moves. But obviously, Daniel Farker knew him very, very well there. And, and I don't yeah. know if you saw the the apology that Aaron's made in the in the wake of signing for Bournemouth when he said, I feel like I've let him, him down. Um, yeah. which I think says, says a lot about the, the reason why he would have been coming was because of Farker more than the championship. But it's, it's the lure of the Premier League. I don't think we're in any way naive about the fact that, you know, you look at Sinistera, look at Adams, um, Aaron's as well. People, players just want to be in the Premier League and they don't care which club it is, the size of the crowds, you know, the history or anything like that. It's the profile, isn't it? And the worldwide audience. And that's just the unfortunate thing you've got to suck up when you get relegated as we did. And we fully deserve to, to be honest. Well, I'll tell you what, Let's get to the bit where everybody's been looking forward to. Um, <laughs> and I dropped my foot in it. I said about Jesse Marsh. And I think some people can see why I've mentioned Jesse Marsh. Because American owners, American manager, or head coach, I should say, seems to be, you know, somebody that, you know, of course, did well at Red Bull. Didn't do well at Leeds. Um, but could he come in and make a bit of an impact, considering we haven't won a single bloody game so far, Dan? If we get beat by Burnley, you'd say that Iriola's tenure is probably over before it's even began. Would Jesse Marsh really steady the ship, or am I talking <laughs> absolute bollocks? <laughs> <laughs> it, it's got the potential to be either, hasn't it? But I, I obviously yeah. lean towards the bollocks side of things because Fair I enough. was I was far from impressed with him at, at Leeds. Yeah. The style, like I said, I've, I've broke down the style of football. It's kick and rush, um, just mm. rebadged. Like I say, we fancy German acronyms. It's not good. It's percentage football. Will it work potentially? I mean, like we <laughs> Jesse Marsh saved his job by beating Bournemouth four three, and then we went to Liverpool. I think it was yeah. was it the week before, week after, whichever it was, just before the World Cup break. So it was those two results that kept him in a job at Leeds. Um, Liverpool one in particular, I think, because well, it was just it was madness, wasn't it? it was that four three at Ellen Road? It could have gone either yeah. way. But to go to Liverpool and to beat them definitely kept him in a job beyond the World Cup break, and that was the mistake that they made. Was you know it's the whole one um, swallow does not a summer make and all that. Uh, the football was bad from the start. Uh, even in the, in the 12 games, there was mitigation in the 12 games at the back end of the previous season because um, it was a club that was kind of, it was spiralling at that point and there was a bit of an air yeah. of crisis about it. So I think it, it provided him either with, maybe with the cover, with an excuse to come in and he, he eased off on the standards as well. And I think one of the things that people have found this uh, this last season when Marsh got fired was um, the players weren't as fit. Uh, so the the runs were done in such a way that Bielsa was run all day and they didn't look yeah. fit under Marsh. It's more about explosive short runs under Marsh, and they didn't look like they had the stamina to see games out. So that's one thing to be careful. If he coaches your players for Red Bull-style football, you might lose the stamina to compete in games. And you know how many goals are scored late in Premier League games yeah. uh, because everybody wants to be the fittest team in the league now. We weren't. Um, we just we didn't look up to it under Marsh, um, sadly. And you know the stuff that we saw towards the back end of, of last season uh, after Marsh had gone, it was. It just got out of control by that point. Anyway, it was. It was beyond salvaging in, in any meaningful sense. But yeah, the football's not good. I question his man management as well. There was a lot of performative nonsense on the on the touchlines. There was a. There's a famous clip that somebody in the West Stand at Ellen Road, which is just behind the dugouts, was filming on a phone, and he was yeah. marching up and down, saying they're stressed, they're stressed, and now speaking to people at the club, saying that like he was causing the players to be stressed by himself doing all this performative stuff on the touchline, a, a lot of kind of theatrics. And I don't know. Why is he doing that? Is that is that to mask his own shortcomings, his own doubts, things like? I, I just I have so many questions about him. And he he wasn't a success um, at Leipzig either. He went there because he'd been at Salzburg, and they tend to promote people from within. Um, yeah. And he his his wife got ill. Um, so she suffered with breast cancer. So I think the combination it was COVID, uh, the lockdowns, that 
um, and the fact that things just did not go well for him at, at Leipzig meant he left that job early. And I think I can't remember it was the sporting director of um, of Leipzig has since been interviewed and said, if we'd have known about Jesse Marsh, what we found out beforehand, we wouldn't have employed him, wouldn't have employed him. Um, so when I say be careful what you wish for, that's what I mean. The football is bad to look at. Um, and the football looks like chaos. It's like school school ground football as well. You know, when kids all swarm around the ball, that's what we saw. There was yeah. a game at Palace where we started off, and this is the, this is the thing that always confused everybody. We, we started off the first half um, in a game against Palace really, really well. We completely control, seemed to control the game. They couldn't live with the pressing. And then they just figured out, it was Patrick Vieira just figured out, well, tell you what, they're swarming at me. Let's just chip it over them and pop it into midfield. Just go a little bit more industrial ourselves. And it completely beat us, completely. And we didn't know what to do to deal with that style of football. There was no plan B. It was just it was just do the, do more of the same and get caught out with four or five players around the ball. And, you know, you can do the maths. If you, if you bypass four or five players with a pass out of trouble, then, you know, you can have a massive overload somewhere on the pitch. And we kept conceding the same goal as well to the far post because he plays very, very narrow. The Red Bull system yeah. is predicated on playing very, very narrow. Um, so we'd all be in the middle of the pitch. If the ball then moves over to the right, all the players would go over to our left to try and defend it. So lo and behold, a player just runs down the, the far side that's been left unmarked time and time and time again. And we never learned and nothing ever changed. And that's one of the reasons why we went down. So it was, it was ugly football, poor man management, poor fitness levels. Um, and I don't know. It just, it never sat well uh, with Leeds fans and some of the stuff he, he was saying in in press conferences and and in, like communicating to the players as well quotes from Gandhi and Mother Teresa it all it all felt a little bit like a little bit like yeah. a TED talk you know just not it just it lacked that that sort of football anchor at the, in the middle of it that knowledge where is it where's where's the expertise so it will be interesting to see where he goes next because I think Leeds fans expect him to go in somewhere and fail and if he was to come into Bournemouth I would not expect him to keep you up. Would he do it as a temporary basis? Because that, to be fair, the, the cut of the video that somebody put on Twitter, or X, as we call it now, was only part of it. And one part was where I mentioned temporary. Now, at the start of last season, I turned around and I did predict Leeds to go down at the very start. Main reason, because of Jesse Marsh. <laughs> but... The funny thing is, and I was thinking about this, I was thinking about this straight after the Wolves game, and I thought, Iriola's style is not working. We're just passing around the back. It's not, that's, it's just failing. We're making these mistakes. Whereas, if we had somebody who was a little bit more direct, and that kick and rush football, maybe we might have a little bit of success. Would he do it temporarily? <sighs> It's difficult because he came into Leeds with 12 games to go after Bielsa and yeah. did it. There's a school of thought among Leeds fans, and I tend to subscribe to it, that it was as much the players digging as out as anything. We had Rafinha, who was who was world-class. And it's interesting, like, speaking to Angus Kinnear, he was saying that uh, Sam Allardyce told him, what you'll find, even at the worst Premier League clubs, you've always got one or two world-class players. Um, and Leeds didn't have any. Leeds didn't have any genuine superstars. But you go back a season and we had Calvin Phillips, who was, and Rafinha, who was, and they dug us out, really. Rafinha yeah. saw us through a lot of games on their own. So the question is, do you have some star quality there that will that will potentially dig you out or make up for the shortcomings of the manager? And I think there's a difference between the 12 games that he came in and oversaw at Leeds and had a little bit of time to introduce some rudimentary changes in style yeah. versus what have you played? Nine games, I've just counted up, um, which yeah. leaves an awful lot of football to be played. It doesn't feel like a coming on a temporary basis. It it feels like you're going to get the best and or worst of Jesse Marsh if he comes in. It's not just 12 games where you've got to see him through to the summer and everyone can breathe. It's you know it's, what's that 29 games? It's a lot yeah. of football. I just I, I you know it makes no difference if he comes in there. I'll I'll sit back and watch it with great interest. But you know from a a neutral point of view, be careful. <laughs> yeah. No, fair enough. Fair enough. So, yeah, everybody, I was talking bollocks. There we go. I'm quite happy to admit, quite happy to admit. And, hey, look, you know, he, he, right. he, he may go into another job and it may be great for him, but it felt to me like he didn't deal very well with the rigours of the Premier League, never properly got a handle on it, never properly had a handle on how to make players better. Fark has done that as well. He's come in since, made the players better. You can see it. Bielsa did it loads. Um, I'm not convinced that Jesse Marsh is that, that sort of coach. He's from the Red Bull farm system. He kind of knows the handbook. 
but I'm not convinced that he knows that much outside of the handbook and knows how to change it, or he's maybe willing to look at new ideas and develop his ideas. So I don't know. Um, you potentially put in a straight jacket on your club if you um, if you put him in because he's very very wedded to the Red Bull system. Who do we bring in though, Dan? <sighs> you had the guy, didn't you? Yeah. 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 I... Completely agree. And did you see his um, appearance on Monday Night Football? I didn't. No, I was um, I was busy at the time with family stuff, but um, I did flick on very very briefly and i know that he sort of he sort of laid out how to beat his former club didn't he when he was uh when he came yeah. back at the weekend so that's obviously gonna hurt isn't it but yeah i mean yeah it's that thing of the thing that you don't have at current is always the thing that will fix it that's the mindset of football fans isn't it so yeah maybe having jesse marsh who's more pragmatic and might play a little bit more direct will fix the shortcomings of, of Iriola but you're then changing style again mid-season and, and the players have spent a full summer being coached by Iriola in certain methods and patterns and then they're going to chuck it all in the bin and do something else so and that's where you've got to have a note of caution as well if you try and change styles too much too often it just confuses the players because I think that they fundamentally like to be like to know what they're doing and have comfort in what they're doing and, and it'd be simplified for them I guess in as many ways as possible and you become Watford as well don't you after yeah, well, yeah, it just becomes chaotic, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And look at what's happened to them. But you know, with with regards to Gary O'Neill, I'm absolutely gutted that we got rid of him. You know, personally, I was a big fan of his. You know, he kept us up those last four games. I think you know, after we beat Leeds, it, it you know, it seemed like he was on the beach. It was like, yeah, got him beaten for for one, but you know, <laughs> just put my feet up now, which maybe was the wrong thing to do. That's how it felt. Probably not yeah, because I'm just I'm was. just looking at your results from last season. You lost the last four, didn't you? After you beat us, yeah, yeah. But uh, I think he's going to go a long, long way. And I think it looks like, in hindsight, we've uh, shot ourselves in the foot, haven't we? Yeah, and it is just be careful what you wish for next. I think is just just make a good choice. But that that's football all over, isn't it? You just got to make sure you get the appointments right. And I think we have, in our own way, ended up with the right appointment in in Daniel Farker. Whether he he good enough for the Premier League is a problem we'll worry about if and when we get back to the Premier League, quite frankly. I think Leeds as a club, we were probably too guilty in recent years of trying to look two or three steps down the road. And that was that was um, uh, an attitude kind of fostered by Radrazani when he was our owner. Um, yeah. You know, coming up with plans for qualifying for Europe. But we, like just because we'd finished ninth doesn't mean that we're necessarily going to keep trending upwards. We've got to make sure we're solidifying the Premier League. And thankfully now with the ownership that we've got, which is um, the investment arm of the 49ers. So it's 49ers Enterprises. There's a lot of venture capital there, American owners, you know, famous golfers and things like that in among the group. But um, I think they've got the clout to to stabilize us in the Premier League. And you, know, you talk about the, the problem at Bournemouth of, of do you look to replace your old guard? It's what you replace them with, isn't it? That's the, yeah. I think, the, the, the crux of the matter is do you get players that are good enough to build on or better than the players that are already in place? No, very, very true. Very true. Well, Dan, um, you know, you never know. Hopefully, Iriola will go on a little bit of a run, you know, starting with Burnley. And it's, why was we worried? But yeah, <laughs> I think get beat by Burnley, it's pretty much all over. But no, thank you so much again for coming on the show. Um, no, it's pleasure, always a pleasure. Yep. Always. And hopefully, fingers crossed, you can come and join us in the Premier League <laughs> next year, uh, not replace us. Um, and we'll be looking forward to uh, Portsmouth and Oxford. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, there is a genuine question about if if you do go down and we go up, what then happens to Sinistera? Obviously, Tyler Adams is your problem now. Um, but Sinistera is on loan. He's going to come back. And I'm not sure he'll be necessarily welcomed back with open arms. So we'll see, won't we? Eh? Well, exactly. And of course, we've spent £120 million on players. Um, what the hell does Bill Foley do if that happens? Yeah, I was going to say your, your financial fair play fair play situation then looks pretty uh, sketchy, doesn't it? Yeah, definitely, definitely. So, well, fingers crossed, we'll be welcoming you to Dean Court next season. Um, <laughs> not, but not in a cup, not in a cup in the league. But Dan, <laughs> pleasure as always, and of course. The link for the square ball is below. Please, please, please do go check out the guys. And, you know, it's, like I say, a pleasure as always. Take care, Craig. And thank you, everybody, for joining us on this show. Please remember to hit the like, the subscribe, the bell button below to be alerted to any new shows we do here at the Cherries in All Departments. Please do put your suggestions below. Should we stick with Iriola? Who should we bring in if we get rid of Iriola? 
Do you see that Sinistera, Adams and Max Ahrens are a success? Jaden Anthony, you already have heard how much Leeds fans love him. Would you be disappointed if he went permanently? Do you want him back? And also, let's hear, you know, your views on the Jesse Marsh suggestion. Would it be good as a temporary measure? Would it be an absolute disaster? Um, I think we know what Leeds fans are probably going to think. But until the next show, up the cherries. We'll see you then. Thank you for joining us.